Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. My name is Alex. To my left is my co-host. I'm Julia. <laughs> I'm going to do it differently every time to keep you guys on your toes. <laughs> and to my ethereal right is... Noel. <laughs> we're doing a good job of picking up on hints. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're the best. <laughs> so good at picking up on we're your on clues. We're on the ball. We're yeah. old pros at this point. <laughs> Yeah, God, we've been doing this for like almost a year, haven't we? We sure have. When did we start? I don't know. I'll have to look. I've been drunk this whole time. So yeah. I... <laughs> I haven't sobered up since 04. It's true. <laughs> Make sure we didn't like miss an anniversary or something. Yeah, I expect gifts. <laughs> we have. We started in September. Of 2013? Yeah, in 2013. So we've actually been going for over a year now. Wow. Happy anniversary, guys. Happy anniversary. Thanks. <laughs> Hopefully we'll remember by the second one. Yeah, we'll get around to it. We're too professional to take the time to acknowledge anniversaries. Yes. So, moving into this month's film, we're doing Halloween 2. Just in time for Christmas. Yes, our first non-Carpenter-directed sequel, which was released on October 30th, 1981. Apparently that actually did become a tradition of, let's release the Halloween films on Halloween. Because why wouldn't we? Exactly. It makes the most sense. <laughs> exactly. So the film was directed by Rick Rosenthal, the husband of Nancy Stevens, who plays the nurse Marion. He also shared an agent with John Carpenter and had just received accolades for a short film named Toyer, which I wasn't able to find online, so I, I don't really know what that film's all about or what it's like. This was Rosenthal's first film, and he went on to have modest success with the likes of Bad Boys, the prison film, not the Michael Bay Bad Boys, <laughs> Ruskies, Distant Thunder, Just a Little Harmless Sex, The Birds 2 Land's End, where he's credited as Ellen Smithy, and most recently, Drones. Hmm. We'll encounter him again as the director of Halloween 8 Resurrection, and along with Rob Zombie, are the only directors to direct more than one Halloween movie. All right. That's not exactly the best company, but anyways. <laughs> Carpenter's friend Tommy Lee Wallace, who we've mentioned in the past, who will direct Halloween 3, was first offered this film, but he really, really didn't like the script. The film is again written and produced by John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. This is the last film the two are going to write together until 1997's Escape from L.A., so it's kind of the end of, uh, end of a little mini era here. We were wondering about that. She does co-produce Halloween 3 with him, but again, after that, she's off and doing like Cronenberg films and Clue and a bunch of TV movies for Showtime. I'm interested. <laughs> yeah. We're into Julia territory with Clue. <laughs> <laughs> but again, they reunite for Julia Escape from L.A. Indeed. Quite. <laughs> Carpenter also composed the score, again with Alan Howarth, and directed a number of reshoots throughout the film. As with The Fog, they were meant to amp up the gore, as Carpenter feared just a straight suspense film wasn't enough for that period of the horror market. Not quite as much as extensive as they did with The Fog. There were just a couple little bits here and there. Like, you know, the guy getting hit with the hammer, mm -hmm. a few extra shots. And then there's also an extra scene of one of the nurses and her teenage friend going out to their car. The one friend needs a ride. And then there's a the kid with the radio who walks mm -hmm. into Michael Myers. They wanted that plot point just so they could explain how Michael Myers knew that she was at the hospital. Gotcha. And also, I should note that the teen who needed to get a ride is Anne Marie Martin, who would go on to a leading role in the TV series Sledgehammer, after which she married author Michael Crichton and retired from acting. She also co-wrote Twister with him. <laughs> well. <laughs> the film was co-produced and distributed by Universal. It was the first of five films Carpenter would make with the studio. It's kind of a troubled relationship that we'll get in and out of throughout the 80s. The budget was $2.5 and it pulled a total U.S. gross of over $25 million. So I've kind of broken this up just a little bit differently than I usually do. Returning from past films, we have actors Jamie Lee Curtis, Donald Pleasance, Nancy Stevens, Nancy Kyes, and Helen Kelly. We have actor and stunt coordinator Dick Warlock. We have still photographer Kim Gottlieb, who also appears as the photographer at the hospital. Associate producer Barry Bernardi. Executive producers Erwin Yablons and Mustafa Akkad. Production manager Jeffrey Chernov. Cinematographer Dean Cundy, who actually turned down doing Poltergeist to come back and do this. Camera operator Ray Stella. First assistant cameras Clyde E. Bryan and Douglas Olivares. 
Sound mixer Tommy Kazi. Sound editors Warren Hamilton and David Lewis Udall. Re-recording mixers Greg Landaker, Bill Varney, and Steve Maslow. Boom operator Joseph Brennan, gaffer Mark Walther, electricians Terry Marshall, Tom Marshall, and Stephen R. Mathis. Hairstylist Frankie Bergman, the one who worked on Full House. Painter Sergei Genetempo. Producer's assistant Randy Chernov. And nurse Morris Costello. Returning for the last time in this series, we have actor Ken Smolka, stunt performers Jack Verboy and Jesse Wayne, boom operator Carl Fisher, rigging gaffer Drain Marshall, location scout production assistant Jeffrey Ryan, and most sadly of all, this is the last time Carpenter would ever work with actor Charles Cyphers. Oh. Which one's he? He's the sheriff. Oh. He was the weatherman in the fog. He was the cop in Someone's Watching Me. He was the federal marshal in Assault on Precinct 13. He's just been kind of like popping up throughout the series. And this is when he sees his dead daughter and goes away. That's the last we ever see of him oh. in Masters of Carpentry. Goodbye, Charles. We will miss you. Yes. I don't know if there's a story behind that. I don't. Because he's still a working actor. They just never work together again. Hmm. So some new names to mention for the first time. Dick Warlock's son Lance Warlock, who plays the teen with the radio, will do stunts in Halloween 3. His brother Billy Warlock, who went on to star on Baywatch and a number of soap operas to this day, also appears as one of the teens looking for their missing friend. Infamous producer Dino De Laurentiis, whose production company supervised the film to Universal, will also do Halloween 3. Camera operator Gary Kibbe will also do Big Trouble in Little China, then become Carpenter's go-to cinematographer on Prince of Darkness, They Live, Blood River, Body Bags, In the Mouth of Madness, Village of the Damned, Escape from L.A., Vampires, and Ghosts of Mars. Executive producer Joe Wolfe, prop maker Terry Feller, painter Jerry Palermo, property masters James Rathburn and Daniel Stoltenberg, effects technician uh, Sam Nicholas, scripts Mark Pearson and Joe Salamdino, customer Francis Vega Aubrey and location manager Amy Agmon will also do Halloween 3. Special effects supervisor Larry Cavano will also do Philadelphia Experiment and Black Moon Rising, neither of which Carpenter made but will be in this project. Sound editor Michael Gutierrez will also do Christine. Sound editor David Stone will also do Christine and Ghosts of Mars. He won an Oscar for doing Bram Stoker's Dracula and got his start in the 70s on Hanna-Barbera cartoons, where he also wrote a few episodes of the new Fred and Barney show. Huh. Stunt performer Diamond Hill Farnsworth will also do They Live. First assistant camera Case Hotchkiss will also do Prince of Darkness and Halloween H2O. Key grip Ronald T. Woodward, grip Laszlo Horvath, and electrician John Antunovich. Antunovich will also do The Thing and Halloween 3. Labor foreman Andrew P. Flores will also do Halloween 3 and Christine. Construction coordinator Walt Hadfield will also do Halloween 3, Christine, and Starman. Dolly grip Chris Cosgrove, assistant editor Kim Ray, and script supervisor Candy Marcellano will also do The Thing. Negative cutter Brian Ralph will also do Starman. Commercial mask maker Don Post, who sculpted the William Shatner mask used in both the first film and here, yeah, they did use the same mask, that's why it looks worn and beat to crap because they didn't exactly store it very well, <laughs> is finally credited for his work in this film and will also provide masks for Halloween 3. Just a couple more little trivia names to mention. Lance Guest got his now legendary starring role in The Last Starfighter because while director Nick Castle was in prep on that film, he visited his friend Carpenter who was overseeing the editing of Halloween 2 at the time and he saw him on the screen. Editor Mark Goldblatt, fresh off Enter the Ninja, would go on to do the likes of Terminator, Terminator 2, Rambo 2, True Lies, Armageddon, X-Men Last Stand, and Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and in the 80s, he directed the Dolph Lundgren Punisher. <laughs> Craft Services operator Robert C. Burris will go on to be a writer and producer for 80s sitcoms Just the Ten of Us and Growing Pains, and briefly seen twice in the movie as a news crew assistant is none other than Dana Carvey. I was going to ask about that. Did you catch him in the credits? I did. Did you see him on screen? No. <laughs> okay. He had a blue ball cap and one of those big puffy winter blue coat vest things that Marty McFly wore. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah, you just see him in a couple of scenes, briefly. He never has a line. Yeah, I wasn't looking for him, so he snuck right by me. And I will say there was a novelization, again by Dennis Etchison, the author of the Fog novelization, though he wrote this one under the name Jack M. Martin. I tried reading it, and I didn't get very far, because I think his writing is incredibly boring and impenetrable, and... I just didn't want to. It was so boring. I made it like about 20 pages and I made it about 80 pages into the fog. Well, you did better than we would have done. Not looking forward to Halloween 3, but thankfully that's the last time I'll encounter him in this project. <laughs> we can hope. I will say, though, that John Carpenter was a fan of the novelization of the first Halloween, and there's actually a few elements from that that he worked into the script here in terms of the whole legend of Sam Hain and the dialogue exchange of I've been trick-or-treated to death, you don't know what death is. <laughs> That's all I have for all the names and trivia. I had probably way more than I should have. 
But why don't we just pause here for a moment, just say if we have any history with the film and if we'd seen it in the past. And Alex, I'll let you start. I do have history with the film. I received it as a Christmas present of all things. When I was obsessed with the first Halloween, I had purchased the first Halloween. Then I put Halloween 2 on my Christmas list and got it. And I believe I watched it a grand total of twice. This is probably my third time viewing it. And Julia, you haven't seen the film before? No, I have not seen the film before. And I saw this film... I got into slasher films and John Carpenter right as I was getting into high school, so mid to late 90s. And I saw this film like right around the same time I saw the first one. So I've always kind of had this tie between the two. I've always kind of watched them as a two-parter. Mm. It's been a while since I had watched it last, probably early 2000s, maybe. I would say 90s for me. Yeah, maybe 99. I don't know. I remember first watching it on a really horrible VHS at Blockbuster that was so bad that I thought the kid with a razor blade in his mouth just had an ice cube in his mouth. You're better off thinking that. <laughs> yeah, but then Anchor Bay came out with their lush widescreen videotapes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so this was probably the first time I'd seen it in over a decade. I've seen the first one, of course, more recently, even preceding this project. Yeah, I think it's been like only a couple years between viewings for Halloween at the most. Maybe a year. But no, yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to discuss this one. Mm -hmm. Picking up right where the last film ended, Michael Myers disappears into the night, and Dr. Loomis and the Sheriff's Department scramble to find him, even as they're pulling out bodies from his massacre and hysteria starts to spread among the populace. Not helping matters are the Sheriff being waylaid by the discovery of his murdered daughter, and a figure who may or may not be Michael Myers being creamed by a police car and torched in an explosion. Survivor Lori Strode is brought to the local hospital for treatment, but while she fights off drug haze and bonds with the chipper paramedic Jimmy, the real Michael Myers tracks her down and starts quietly picking off all the staff. By the time Loomis learns the true motive behind Michael, that he and Lori are actually siblings, Lori is running for her life and even some fresh bullets from Loomis aren't enough to stop Michael, though he is blinded by some headshots. Luring Michael into an operating chamber, a stabbed and dying Loomis leaks out as many different gases as he can, then flicks a lighter, sending he and Michael up in a ball of flame. A torched Michael still attempts to pursue Laurie, but only for a moment before he succumbs and dies. Or does he? <laughs> so yes, Alex, do you recommend this movie? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> I think they missed a golden opportunity. As I was watching this, I'm like, wow, I love that it's a continuity, that it takes place directly after the first film. I thought it would be amazing to see a movie where they, like, have a manhunt throughout the town and try to catch him as he sneaks around the houses and then picks off more people on his quest to kill Laurie Strode. I thought that would have been really cool of, like, the logistical nightmare of trying to find this masked killer during Halloween, this endless night of Halloween and trick-or-treating that seems to be going on in Haddonfield. And I think, as you say, they tried to compete with the horror films of the day and went right into tool sheds and schlock. Julia, do you recommend the movie? No. I found it to be a dour, dire <laughs> dirge of overly dramatic despicability. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> there was death, but sadly no dismemberment. I found it overall really sad. And um, <laughs> quite a few times it made me quite upset. Yeah, there's no real joy in this film. It's very workmanlike in the way it goes about itself. I find if I'm going to watch a, a mass murder type movie, mm -hmm. I need some kind of levity and I need to be disassociated from the people that are being killed. I'm guessing Bud didn't count. Um, he tried his best. He yeah. was valiant. He smoked doobies. He tried. <laughs> he loved boobs. Definitely my favorite. <laughs> you know, he was definitely my favorite. Yeah. But I found a lot of the... Um, yeah, I had a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could discuss those. Yeah. Again, yeah. Boy, wait till we keep going because this set a high bar for the sequels. <laughs> <laughs> As a horror sequel, I'm going to say this right now. It does it better than most. It has the majority of the original cast. The continuity is there. The production value is there. It mm -hmm. is a high bar for horror sequels in general. And that's actually why I'm going to recommend it. Now, Ed, that is a mild recommend. <laughs> it is a film that has a lot of problems, and it felt like a sequel that they made because they had to. But I still like that they brought a lot of the same crew back, so it has a lot of the same technical polish. It looks great. It's edited very well, except for a few parts where, I, for some reason, there was some weird continuity on some of Jamie Lee Curtis's shots. <laughs> I think when it follows the first film is where it's at its strongest. In terms of, yeah, the town hysteria, in terms of Loomis running around with the sheriff's department trying to find these things, in terms of pulling out the bodies. 
in terms of that whole, did we actually get him or is this just some other random kid? I like it when it's doing that. And I also like the climax. I think there's a lot of good tension near the climax. But a lot of the middle film at the hospital, it's a very rote slasher movie where you have very poorly defined characters doing very stupid things and usually just walking right into their own deaths. Mm -hmm. There is still a lot of good atmosphere and tension, but none of these characters are developed enough to make you care what's happening to them. I like what's going on with Lori, even though she's in a bed for half the movie. And I like Jimmy, but everyone else is just kind of, I mean, Bud is your typical asshole that you kind of want to see killed. All of the nurses are pretty much indistinguishable and nothing is really ever given to them to define them as characters, which was kind of really let me down given how well they defined all the three teenage girls in Halloween one, that they just kind of like threw these people on the page. I even read the screenplay to this and I couldn't keep track of who each of the nurses were because Mm. they gave you nothing in terms of how each of them are individually responding to things in terms of backstory, in terms of any of that. There was nothing. It felt like Carpenter shat out a script because he needed to. Mm Mm-hmm. I still think, though, in some ways, I like it better than The Fog. In some ways, I don't, because I think there's at least more going on in here than there is The Fog, but The Fog had better defined characters and stuff. Yeah, I'm going with The Fog because of the characters. See, and I'm like stuck in between. I can't really slide one way or the other. I like parts of one. I don't like parts of one. I I still enjoy the movie enough that I do think it is a worthy follow-up to the original. Hmm. If you like the original and you want to see a sequel... Here it is. (laughs) Yeah, it's not going to blow you away as much as the first film did, but it's also, I don't find that terrible of a disappointment because it does have all that strong chaos stuff with Loomis running around, and it has a good climax. I think it's actually an acceptable ending to the Halloween story, if they had let it end there. (laughs) Which they did not. No, and (laughs) which we'll get to in future episodes. More of it works for me than it doesn't. And I think, yeah, it is very rote, but it's still well executed. I'm ultimately still going to slide on recommending this, though I have many problems with it, and we will probably get to those in discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we just talk about Lori? Yeah. How she's basically just laying around for a good half of the movie before she kind of pulls herself out of the bed. An interesting choice, and further shows that maybe she's not as great of a scream queen as I wanted her to be from the first film, as we discussed. It's not her fault, too. No, yeah, and it's not so much that she's not doing anything performance-wise, because she's doing a lot of really good stuff. She's really throwing herself around when she's, Mm. like, wearing almost nothing. But yeah, it's just there's nothing there on the page for her to do. No, I will never fall Jamie Lee Curtis. She's a fine actor. But they basically drug her throughout most of the film, and Mm -hmm. that does ramp up the tension to a bit, but most of the tension is for our benefit. She doesn't know that he's coming. She doesn't know that he wants her. She doesn't know anything about him. Even at the revelation, I don't even know if she remembers it because she seems to be comatose. I would almost take the hospital stuff and squash it down in a half an hour Mm -hmm. and have that be the middle act and then go away from the hospital for the third act. Yeah, I would have him, it all leading up to the hospital, of them trying to stop him throughout the town and nothing seems to work and he gets to the hospital anyways. And the only problem with that is there's no reason why they wouldn't just straight away bring Lori to the hospital. She could be in the hospital, but him trying to get there. Uh, yeah, I would put less focus on Lori in the hospital, put most of the focus on all that. And then when they find out about the connection, they're like, where did they bring Lori Strode? Cut to mm-hmm. the hospital. Just as the power goes out, you know? And logically speaking, she should be in the hospital. She should be in shock. She should be messed up from the first film. And it adds that incredible layer of tension. When she's trying to get away from him, drugged Mm -hmm. up, can't see straight, you are very involved. You're basically yelling at the camera for her to get out or to hide somewhere. Maybe stay hidden. (laughs) And there are some of those nice carpenter touches of, you know, she doesn't want to go to sleep, but they keep drugging her. She doesn't know when she's got a tetanus shot. They can't find her parents. There were even some extra deleted scenes, more between her and Jimmy, like a scene where he actually comes and tells her, look, they got Michael Myers, he was killed, they just said it on the radio, and she kind of freaks out. Does she believe him? No, and then that's actually why they further drug her, which is why she's in that kind of comatose state. Ah, I see. I wish that they had done something more there. The story needed an extra chapter, it needed to spend less time at the hospital. Either make that the climax, or make that the middle portion, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it needed to get out of the hospital. And it was just trying things out too much with characters we didn't care about. Exactly. And maybe spend a little time working on the dialogue of those characters just to give them some personality. Where were Laurie's parents? Was it Rob Zombie? Did he kill them? (laughs) 
it, they never reveal. They never reveal where her parents are. That's some bad parenting. <laughs> that would have actually been nice for Halloween 3. Is I almost wish like every film in the series would just literally pick up right at the moment of the last film. Mm -hmm. The next Halloween would be, okay, now that they're driving her away from this and they're carting all the bodies out of the hospital, where are her parents? And how does that tie into the next story? Exactly. Kind of be like Saw. Every film just comes right out of the last one. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen more than one. It should be no that this was meant to be the end. They didn't want to make any more sequels. They wanted a definite ending. They wanted to do um, the... Uh, the anthology. Anthology series, which is great. They shouldn't have even done a sequel to Halloween. I know why they did, because of Cha-Ching, but they right. should have gone with the anthology aspect, which would have been great. Great sound design in this movie. I love the crickets. Oh, yeah. Took me back to my hometown. I'm just like, that's exactly what it would sound like out there. And these are all like those multi-Oscar winning sound guys who worked on his last two films mm -hmm. and we'll keep working with them. A lot of the guys right off Empire Strikes Back. Julia, do you have any thoughts? Well, right before we watched it, Alex told me that, because I, I don't know anything about the Halloween or the <laughs> Halloween sequel. So I was like, what is this one about? I think we we're eating dinner or whatever mm. before we were going to watch it. And he's like, oh, well, this one is they pick up right after the last one. And I was like, that's really sad. <laughs> Where I'm just like, really? Just, I think Lori's had enough. <laughs> Where I'm like, do I really have to watch Lori go through this all over again? <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, on the one hand, I really like that idea because it shows the consequences of the first film. Yeah, like in theory, I was like, oh, that sounds like a really good idea. Because a lot of times that's why you want a sequel is because you want the continuing mm -hmm. story of the thing that you liked, not mm -hmm. a reinterpretation of the thing that you liked. Mm -hmm. But in this type of situation where she's essentially hunted, you're just kind of like, give the chick a break. <laughs> <laughs> and they didn't really go far enough in that regard. Like they didn't show the consequences. She doesn't really think too much about her friends. They show, like, one reaction shot, and they bring um, Annie back, which was great, but it was basically just so he could get in uh, Loomis's face. And it wasn't right. even as much as, like, the Alex Kittner scene from Jaws that I would have liked to have seen. Right. I mean, it was still good that they paid some attention and showed that other people were killed, and it wasn't just Lori affected. Though why is he, like, pulling the sheet off of his dead daughter, exposing her slit throat to the news media that's standing right behind him? I did think that, and then I also <laughs> thought, you know what, I wouldn't give a shit if it was my kid. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even notice that yeah. anyone was right. around me. Yeah, that's true. He's probably in shock. And should be off the force immediately. He did. Like, they sent him home. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah, they sent him home. The guy drove him home. Then he got blonde, square-jawed sheriff guy. Yeah. Right. Took him home. Everyone got a little bit blonder in this. Lori got some highlights in between. She's wearing a full wig because Jamie Lee Curtis, her signature short-haired look that she's had, she had already gotten that by this point. Oh, I see. So they needed a wigger. I see. Yeah, because when they pulled her out of the house, I was like, who is that? <laughs> yeah. And I was, because she was so blonde, I didn't recognize her. What I do like is that everyone's blaming Loomis, even though it really isn't his fault. He's the only one doing anything. <laughs> He's the only one doing anything, and the reason everything went wrong is because everyone ignored what he was trying to get them to do. It's true. In terms of locking Michael down. And yet everyone is like, you let him out, you let him out. They needed more of that. Mm -hmm. They did. One of the original concepts for the film was that it was going to take place a few years later, where it was going to deal with Laurie still dealing with, you know, some of the post-traumatic stress of it, living in a someone's watching me style high-rise apartment. And it was going to be Michael Myers killing everyone in a high-rise building. Hmm. Yeah, you could probably make an interesting thriller out of that, but... We already had someone's watching me. Yeah, exactly. And that had the psychological component that this one wouldn't? No, it would be pretty much systematic. I'm more interested in that let's pick up right after. But still, then it's like you have all this really neat, interesting stuff. Now let's just go focus on the hospital for a while. A very dark hospital. Very poorly lit hospital. I've never been in a hospital that sparsely attended and that dark. I would have liked a little bit of a throwaway dialogue for that one. There was actually one of the cutscenes is while Lori's having her freak out of, no, he's not dead. He's still coming for me. And they're trying to sedate her. That's when the power goes out. Oh. So they're on emergency power. I see. Yeah. And there are supposed to actually be patients in some of the rooms, which you do see one of the nurses go off and attend a buzzing light. Not the one that's Bud, but one of the right. other ones later on. Because they have a whole infant ward, but no mothers. Then, yeah, there's the whole infant ward. Yeah. Michael Myers looming over the babies. It's very terrifying. And a very bad nurse who is going off to have sex when she should have been watching them. Yeah, the entire sequence with Bud and, and the nurse that he's with, I, can, I still don't remember which any of the nurses are. It was so obligatory, we need a gore and tit scene. Yeah, it, well, it's the fog thing again. They must have added these scenes or something. Just no, to... that one was actually in the script. Wow, because that takes a lot of suspense. That's so of the time that it really dates the film. And notice how when he's killed, 
it's in the back and obscured, and yet when she's killed, it's like, we gotta bear the bruisms, show it as gory as we can. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's not nice. There is an unpleasantness to the way that they're focusing. It's the slasher trope of let's just focus on the kill instead of who's getting killed. Yeah, it's true. Like the inventiveness of the kill. And normally I'm fine with that because usually it's funnier in a lot of <laughs> 80s slashers. Like there's skill to Halloween 2, which makes it a little bit more unpleasant. And there's no joy in what they're right. doing where they're just like, hey, this is what you want. It's sort of like a roller coaster. You pay your money. We show you some kills, you make out with your girlfriend, you leave. This one's just kind of like, there's an actual craft and skill to it, and it makes it, I don't know, like very Argento, where it just becomes tasteless. (laughs) There's an interesting contrast that could be made between that scene in the hot tub and the scene in the first film, where, you know, he comes into the room wearing the ghost sheet and the Mm -hmm. glasses, and, you know, she's flirting with him a bit, and then he comes up behind her and strangles her. Mm -hmm. There's still a lot of thought and almost art to that scene, and in this one... You feel so uncomfortable for the nurse, first of all, that she's got to be in that tub with Bud. Yeah. And then, yeah, then they're just making it as exploitative and trashy as they can. That's the word, yeah. And even the whole bit where she's, like, nibbling on his hand, which has got to taste nasty. No, I would imagine. With all the grime and blood that he's had on it. I'm surprised she didn't react to that. No. I mean, I do like some of the moments. Like, I love the scene where Jimmy finds the head nurse who's been drained of blood. Mm -hmm. And he slips in the puddle and knocks himself out. And then you have the visibly concussed Jimmy just wandering out to his car where he finds Lori, passes out right into the horn of the car. Everything goes wrong. Yeah, the shots of the door, if he's going to come out of the door or not, were very scary. Mm -hmm. But then he's just right on the other side, which is very silly. (laughs) He's on the other side of the parking lot. I mean, there were a lot of really nice shots, but again, they're just trying to emphasize, oh, he can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. The tension of that open door was better than anything any jump scare could have been. Yeah, or I like the one moment where you have the one nurse checking out the security station, and she doesn't see him walking into a room on the monitor, and as she walks off, you see her going down the exact same hall that he just went into the door in. And stuff like that is really good. At first, I was like, they could have had a more well-lit hospital, which I found kind of scary, but then I'm thinking maybe that's just because of Exorcist 3. There's this one scene at a hospital that's very scary, and it's not practical. They needed to not cut the explanation that the power was cut. They really needed to keep that in. There's a few explanations they should have kept in, including Lori being comatose with her eyes open, because I yeah. thought she was dead the first time. And the explanation for those was both the same scene. Oh, yeah? Okay. I'm surprised why they cut it. And there was actually a final Jimmy scene when she gets into the ambulance and is driving away. This figure sits up behind her, and the sheet comes down, and it's Jimmy with his head bandaged up. So, uh, <laughs> where are we? <laughs> Poor, poor Laurie. And she, like, grabs his hand and says, We lived. We lived. And it was kind of really cheesy. And then Loomis pops in and is like, You don't know what death is. A steaming Loomis. <laughs> <laughs> You're only alive as long as he lets you be alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty good. I still, I get thrills from the movie. It's a cheap slasher movie. Mm. But in terms of, I, I've seen so many shitty slasher movies mm-hmm. that this one is just more classily made. Yeah. And it does have clever bits, like Jimmy there in the climax and all the Loomis running around. There is a lot of thought to it. And it should be pointed out that two of the most important aspects of the franchise as a whole came as a result of this film. One, that Laurie is his sister and that he's actually just trying to kill his own relatives. That carries on through the entire franchise. Mm -hmm. And the use of Mr. Sandman on the soundtrack. Right, yeah. Which I thought was perfect in the end credits, where you just have the shot of the flaming Michael Myers and the Mr. Sandman. Yeah, I like that as well, if they had ended it. (laughs) But they do not, as we will see in possibly part four. No spoilers. Yes, part four and H2O, which kind of erases parts four, five, and six. Uh, Yeah, it does, which I'm not too upset about. We'll get there. We will get there eventually. Any other, like, specific scenes or actors that we want to bring up? I'm not a huge... I'm, I'm a little too negative. I want to be a bit more positive about certain things. It does have a kind of a round-robin thing where you're like, that was really good, but it's always followed by something crazy. So, like, Loomis trying to warn the police. Good. The kid that wanders in front of the cop car that doesn't seem to see him and smashes into him and immediately explodes and sets him on fire. Bad. Well, when the friends are looking for him, they do say he was really drunk. It's true, but I think the cop should have had a bit more of a heavy foot on the old uh, brake pedal. Funny thing, the cop who killed the fake Michael Myers and stumbles out of the cop car is played by Dick Warlock, who plays the real Michael Myers. That is very, uh, that's art right there. (laughs) Other funny thing that is also incredibly sad, the fake Michael Myers who gets killed is named as Ben Tramer. Ben Tramer in the first film is the boy that Laurie was talking to her friends about having a crush on at school and wanting to go to a party with. 
Oh, well played movie. No happy endings for anyone. <laughs> so she missed out on going to this party with Ben Tramer and Ben Tramer got killed. Oh. While dressed as her killer. And that's his smoking corpse on a slab. <laughs> oh, Halloween. Uh, Julia, you're right. There is a lot of weird sadness and darkness to this movie. Yeah, I just I just found it to just be so dour. Yeah. yeah. And I think it didn't help that they were in this filthy hospital. Yeah. Like, they're always going into storage rooms. Like, why is everything so dirty? <laughs> like, <laughs> everything's so disorganized. Things are falling out of closets. This is not a well-run hospital. No one's on staff. It's the precinct 13 of hospitals. They're going <laughs> to shut it down later that night. There needed to be some more humor. We were lacking a lot of that carpenter wit. Yeah. You got some bits there, like, where the reporter is like, remember, you need to get a parent's permission to get a statement from a kid. But if you can't get the parents' permission, just get a statement anyways. <laughs> she had an entire scene in the script where she tried... You have this moment where she's overhearing the conversation between Loomis and the sheriff, and she was going to follow them to the hospital, and Michael Myers was going to pop out of her trunk and kill her. <laughs> and that was the original explanation for how he got to the hospital. I see. Because he was hiding in her car. Instead of just walking in. Hearing it on the radio exactly. and being like, hey, I know who that is somehow. I actually much prefer that scene where you just have him walking down the street, hearing the radio, and just walking among costumed people on Halloween. But you know what would be on the radio before they would release a victim's name? Would be a description of the killer. Yeah, they would be a manhunt for this killer before they were just like, and the victim is at this hospital. That is a minor. The, yeah. <laughs> whose parents have not been contacted. Her name would never be released onto the radio. This was the 70s before those laws were in place. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Oh, I hope the killer's not listening to this, but the victim is at one uh, She seems to be quite vulnerable. Yeah. But... <laughs> there is no guard whatsoever on her door, and the doors are unlocked. Also, oh. the power is out. Also, guys, we're not going to tell you what to look for. Just look out. <laughs> and also, because they added that scene in reshoots, they didn't want to have the hearing things on the radio just be in one single scene to make it too much of a plot device. So then they added that entire additional scene where he breaks into the woman's house and kills her while she's listening to the radio which was entirely added in reshoots and has nothing to do with the plot of the movie. Yeah, Michael Myers was on too many side quests in this movie. I just didn't understand why he was killing people. Until he went after Lori, essentially. I'm just like, why is he murdering these people? I'll buy the Lori thing. All his other kills, with the exception of anyone who's either guarding her or in his way between him and her, makes no sense to me. I need more of an explanation, more than Sam Hain. I mean, what I liked about the first film was that he's actually building a display with the corpses. Here, he isn't. He doesn't do anything with the... He, like, strings up the security guard. Yeah, he's not as whimsical in this film. Yeah, I mean, you would think, like, she would come around to find, like, them all gathered around as, like, parents overlooking the baby ward or something. I have a lot of problems with the baby ward. <laughs> a lot of problems with that. It's just, I think I wrote down that the nurse who died in the hot tub... Despicable. Yeah. A absolutely despicable. Even more so than Michael Myers, who did not kill those. Uh... Even Michael Myers didn't put those babies at risk, but she did. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. I and mean, there was no reason for the hot tub scene. No, yeah. not And at she's all. like, oh, we'll totally have sex, which, by the way, a nurse would never do. No. <laughs> but right. she's like, yeah, let's totally have sex, but we got to leave the door open. Guess what they didn't do? Leave the door open. They also went into a hot tub where you couldn't possibly hear anything. Yeah. Another note in the hot tub, why does it go up to scalding? <laughs> That's a weird setting for a therapeutic hot tub. Here's the other thing. <laughs> They're not bringing into the hospital the cop who hit the one guy with his car and caused a big explosion. They just took him right to the morgue. <laughs> They're not bringing anyone else who had like light burns or shrapnel wounds from the explosion. That should cause like another 10, 20 people to come to the hospital. They don't have the staff to support that. No, there's only one nurse and she's having sex with someone in a scalding hot tub. <laughs> and there's one doctor who I don't know if you caught in the dialogue was drunk because he was at the same party that Lori's parents were at. He and why drunk. did why did Michael go and kill the doctor? He was off camera. He was secluded. There was absolutely no reason. He was just picking everyone off. And even then, he's like turns on the doctor's shower so that if anyone pokes in, they're just going to hear the shower. Yeah, that's weird. There was a lot of weird stuff in this movie. It, it's, you know, Michael Myers is one of those killers who just kills. He doesn't have a reason. That's not going to work for everyone. <laughs> Also, how come when the woman who I actually was like, okay, like the nurse where I was yeah. like, great, I'm looking forward to you getting killed because you're a terrible person. Yeah. You should, I'm not going to feel sorry for you. And then of course I did because the poor woman had died topless <laughs> being scalded yeah. in the face. And yeah. I was like, okay, she didn't deserve that. No. And then literally like yank her up, face melted, go wide for one more boob shot. Yeah, yeah, one more. Thanks, guys. But he is sticking her... How come his hands aren't burnt? Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It's like Jason and Jason X <laughs> with the freezing stuff. <laughs> I will say this. From this film onward, he has burn scars. 
Oh, does he? On his hands? On his entire body. He has to have it over his entire body. Oh, his whole body. Because he was full. He was shot burned, in the yeah. head twice. Do they really like or do we want to wait till the fourth one to find out how he got out of the scrape? <laughs> <laughs> We'll wait till we get there. I will say this. They do not go zombie route. Uh, No, they don't. That's Jason Voorhees exclusive. He's just crazy doesn't die guy. Because, I mean, he's been shot at least 10 times, including two shots to the head. Professor Loomis, in all the subsequent sequels, is also badly burned and scarred. He is burned and scarred. Yes, I will buy that. Professor Loomis survives? (laughs) <laughs> spoilers survives well, spoilers but I, I have already said that he's going to be in other sequels so but it's yeah. true yeah they both survive michael yeah. myers and professor loomis they couldn't get jamie lee to do any more sequels for a while at least so they say she's dead for the most of them yeah they make him be the kind of recurring hero character yeah you'll have to see okay. and i don't think they ever really get to the bottom of why michael is being michael uh, well some of the sequels have explanations yeah we'll wait till we get there because some yeah. of them are pretty crazy well, right now, we'll just say, Mikey, he likes it. He wants to kill his family. Yes. We don't know why, he just does. He just pretty much goes through anyone who gets between him and his family. Or anyone who's listening to the radio. And most of the reason why he's killing people at the hospital is because he just hasn't found where Lori is yet, and he just keeps coming across them first. Yeah. The old people, the nice nod to Elvis, more mayo on your sandwich. <laughs> uh they just, uh, she just steals See, the knife. He had no reason to kill them. No, he just got the knife, yeah. Yeah. That's the old Michael. Right there, that's the Michael where he doesn't kill people. They're watching Night of the Living Dead. I can appreciate that. They're fans of the genre. I will leave them be. Yes. <laughs> They're my people. <laughs> Why does Michael walk so slow? He walks very slow, even for a right. uh, killer from the movies. I understand, like, the determin- like the fact that they don't run because it's scarier, right? Yeah, if yeah, they don't right. run, that they're that's just walking exactly really quickly. It. But he walks crazy slow. Yeah. Yeah. It's even more exaggerated in this film than it was in the last one. Because the last one, it was Nick Castle playing him who had this kind of lean gait to him that gave him this kind of fluidity of movement. Mm-hmm. And in this one, he's being played by uh, Dick Warlock, who's kind of more just a stocky stuntman. He's small. He seems smaller than usual. I think he just looks small because later on they get so big. He's yeah. not super short. He's like 5'11", 6 feet, but he was wearing lifts to try to make himself bigger. That's a good point. Yeah. Because Jason just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, Jason becomes a wrestler. <laughs> and that's actually going to happen in this series, too. Yeah, Michael will get bigger, if I remember. Before they're like, eh, let's rein him back a little bit. Until Rob Zombie gets his hands on him and then he becomes Frankenstein's <laughs> he just becomes monster. He professional wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> And then I should say, this is the last film that they have the original mask for. Yeah, the mask looks hella fake in part four, if I remember correctly. It's very clean and foamy looking, if I it's remember. seriously until H2O, where they actually track down the Shatner mask to make a clean mold of it. All of the masks are going to look pretty shitty. Yeah. Doesn't it eventually be, are they all theatrical or does it become TV movies at a certain point? No, they're all theaters. Oh, huh, interesting. So I guess that is the question. Do you guys want to continue doing the Halloween series as episodes? That's up to Julia. (laughs) Julia? Honestly, I'm not really feeling it right now. No? I think uh, it's just... Because I am worried about three. It's going to be a little while till we get to... uh, Well, we got Halloween three, but that's kind of its own thing because they were trying something. I'm a little bit worried about Halloween three, to be honest. Alex told me the main problem that I had with this movie. She doesn't like kids. She's I don't Leon. like kids getting hurt. No women, no yeah. kids. And like I had to watch this kid with a razor blade in his face. Yeah. I don't even remember that. And then honestly, the besides the babies being in danger, the fact that I had to watch that cop look at his dead daughter. Yeah. It's like, I don't need to see that. Like if I'm going to watch a slasher movie, which granted I don't have mm. a lot of experience with that kind of thing. I don't want to know who the kid's parents are. I don't want to see their parents have to look at their dead children. I don't want babies to be hurt. I don't want any young Mm -hmm. children to be killed. I think that tilts it in a direction that I'm not interested in. Right. We are sensitive to you. I am sensitive. (laughs) (laughs) I think Julia should have a uh, clause where she can leave the room at any time and then I'll make notes. (laughs) That is absolutely, yeah. I used to be so much more hardcore, guys. I Parenthood, really man. I it really it affects me even as, not as much as you, but I get it too. Like, as soon as I saw Nancy, I'm like, I couldn't even function after that, like, once they reveal Annie. See, I thought that was, like, one of the strongest scenes of the film. I wish that the rest of the film had been worthy of it. Because mm-hmm. it was an emotional punch. I'm just like, you got to go all the way with that or not at all in my books. Especially since through Masters of Carpentry, we've... That's Nancy Kyes. That's a familiar face that we've seen in multiple films. And we love her. Yeah. <laughs> She's a sassy lady and we love her. She comes back in Halloween 3. There you go. Wait, what? It's not my... It's that's a, the same character. Not same it's character. not the same character. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah, we'll wait till we get to Halloween 3 in terms of whether or not we do full episodes for the rest of the sequels. I will let Julia decide that. 
I would be game to it just because there is some just absolute insanity in them that I would be very curious to discuss. I will give you this incentive. If you can make it to part six, Paul Rudd is in it. I enjoy Paul Rudd. <laughs> I would at least like to do H2O just because that is them trying to bring it back. I think is probably the best sequel. To my knowledge now, it's been a long time since I've seen it. If I remember correctly, it owes a lot to Scream, but which owes a lot to Halloween, so it's kind of like the snake eating its own tail, but I remember it being fun in that kind of like 90s slasher genre where they like know too much about horror films and stuff like that. And it's also Laurie comes back. Yes, we will get Jamie Lee Curtis in her most proactive role to date. I won't make you guys watch the Rob Zombies, but I would be very curious to discuss the rest of them with you. So we'll see where you're at when we get closer to them. I don't know if I could do the Rob Zombies again. <laughs> no, I... Eh. It was a... Uh... I'm pretty much just like, here's my remakes episode. Just leave it at that. Why? Yeah. What's the difference? They're just grosser. Yeah. <laughs> or are they like more like Saw movies? Oh. Um... It's Rob Zombie doing like House of the Dead, Devil's Rejects. I haven't seen... She hasn't anything. seen any Rob Zombie films. It's I mean, hard. I know who Rob Zombie is, obviously, but I, I haven't seen any of his movies. Ugh. <sighs> It's not a good scene. Crazy, amped up gore, trash, sleaze. Everything is grimy and disgusting. Everyone's angry. Is it like torture porn? I wouldn't go that far. I, I it's, It borders on that. It, at times, yeah. Especially the hospital segments of Halloween 1. Yeah, if you want an enormous amount of backstory that isn't needed for Michael Myers, Halloween. That has nothing zombie. to do with Michael Myers, yeah. Yeah. I really think that it's hard because, I mean, without making too many generalities, these movies aren't made for me. Like, these movies are made for me 10 years ago. Right. Regardless yes. of when in time they were made, if I had seen this 10 years ago, I probably would have a lot more love for it. Mm -hmm. But as, a, like, an adult mother, it's not really like, you know what, adult mother really wants to see. <laughs> right. But that's why you're here, is to scold us naughty gore fans of the past. I mean, granted, but <laughs> if I was like, oh, man, we should totally watch Train Spotting again. It's amazing. Yeah. And then I'd watch it now and I'd be like, what the hell is this? <laughs> What are those people doing? I will say, until the Rob Zombie films, none of them are terribly gory. There's nothing worse in any of the upcoming ones than what we've seen here. Mm -hmm. I think my main reason why Part 2 really doesn't work for some people is that it's trying to do both. It's trying to be a silly 80s slasher movie, and it's trying to be more of a high-class, glossy, intelligent thriller. And it's not quite pulling either one of them off. I do completely actually agree with that. That's exactly the problem that I have yeah. with it. Because a lot of the things that I really loved about Halloween was the character development, the dialogue, the little vignette scenes that they had together. Mm -hmm. That's what I liked. And you have some of that here, but not enough. And then the things that I like really love about, say, Jason Voorhees is the fact that it's just ridiculousness, mm -hmm. right? And then when you merge those two things together, it's so conflicting. Yeah. yeah. That it's difficult and then it almost makes you disconnect. Yeah. Well, not almost. It does make you disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> See, and that's why I think you might get into some of the other sequels more because they're more just straight that. Where you're not even beating around the bush. They are more just straight Friday the 13th style crazy 80s slash movies. Mm -hmm. Right. Without Michael walking through a glass door. <laughs> I actually really like that. I thought that were like really cool. Yes. <laughs> Where he shot the gun and then it, the glass exploded just in time for him to walk through it. Yeah. That looked yeah. really cool. It did look really cool. Any other like final thoughts on Halloween 2? Because I think we kind of ran out of things to say about it because it's another one of those ones where there's just not really that much to say about it, sadly. No. If Lori had stayed where she was in that one room, it would take Michael hours. There would have been at least a change in shift at that point. <laughs> <laughs> When she was really disoriented and going down the hallway, and I was like, Lori, why don't you just go get in that closet there? Yeah. Why don't you just go get in that closet? It would take him hours to find you. Check every room, open every door, go through everything, and just kind of, you know, take care of yourself, Lori. <laughs> We're feeling yeah. for you. And too many kills off screen. I find that's the mark of when a film isn't like a horror film. You should have an accountability for every death off screen, unless it's supposed to be some sort of surprise. You weren't supposed to see the security guard get killed. So there was supposed to be more about that mystery of suddenly it's just more and more people you can't find. Mm -hmm. Where did the head nurse go? Where did the doctor go? Where's the security guard? And I would have liked that. You kind of got that with the doctor and the head nurse and that they literally just disappear and then you find them dead. Mm -hmm. And then when you find the main doctor, he's like, it's a needle in the eye. Oh, now I've got you. Here's a needle in the eye. <laughs> in her temple, he, he pumped air into her brain. Right. That's often mistaken as they put a needle in her eye. Oh, okay. Again, I like bits like that. But again, I wish that they had developed the characters more so that it actually had some impact. I think the head nurse actually got some nice character moments just because she was a good actress. Yeah. And then I was all like sad when she went away. Yeah. 
again, I really like the way that they find her dead. The blood looks fake as hell. Oh, yeah. It's paint. <laughs> but I like this setup there, and I love that punch of Jimmy turns to run, and he slips and knocks himself out. That would be me in a horror film. There are moments in this where I thought it was really clever and really sharp, and moments where it just was really lazy and really dumb. I don't understand Dr. Loomis's interest in Michael. He's bored. He needs a hobby. Probably a widower. He's passionate because he's never seen anyone else like that. But I mean, they actually talk about it like with the lady when she comes back to get him. Yeah. That in the entire time that he's been in the mental hospital, he's never spoken a word. Yeah, he kind of fills in his own backstory where he's like, this guy's staring off at nothing. I think he's pure evil. <laughs> he is. He's like projecting. But then again, he's not wrong. It's yeah. a long time to work with someone who will not speak with you, who will not communicate with you, who doesn't move. Like that's, come on, guy, move yeah. on. <laughs> and then Lori is having these flashbacks to when her parents as a child brought her to see Michael. Why would they do that? <laughs> exactly. Why would they do that? Especially when they fought so hard to get the records expunged. Exactly. There was actually a cut scene in the script where during her flashback, she sees her parents arguing in the car. Her dad wants her to know who she is. Her mom doesn't. Her mom's right. <laughs> well, yeah, that doesn't make any sense either because her yeah. mom in the dream was like, I'm not your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Let's fold more laundry. That's also what I like about the head nurse's death is that you just have these moments throughout the film where you just see this blood dripping into a puddle. Mm -hmm. Like during that hallucination sequence they're intercutting that with blood dripping into a puddle and then it's like another 10 15 minutes goes by before you get the context for what that was that you were seeing yeah that was i thought a very nicely done bit i get why it didn't work for you guys it is it's a dour film there are bits where it feels burned out i should say this is the last script john carpenter himself writes for like another six seven years not until prince of darkness so he doesn't write the thing nope Whoa. For, like, his next few films, he gets a number of writers that he works with on a number of films. Mm -hmm. But no, he does not himself put pen to paper again until we get to Prince of Darkness. And even by then, Deborah Hill's no longer working with him. To be fair, she didn't co-write Assault on Precinct 13 or Someone's Watching Me with him. And those mm -hmm. were two fantastic scripts. I'm very interested in Prince of Darkness. I don't know anything about that movie. I'll be interested to hear what you guys... I think we're also hitting a period of transition where Carpenter is losing his support structure. Because, I mean, yeah, Deborah Hill, this and Halloween 3 are kind of the end of their working relationship until they reunite for Escape from L.A. Dean Cundy, his DP, is just going to do a few more films before he runs off of Spielberg. And Tommy Lee Wallace and Nick Castle, who worked on all his earlier films, they're already gone and making their own movies. Not only is Carpenter starting to rein back on what he's doing on his films in terms of writing, in terms of editing, all that stuff, he even has another guy, Alan Howarth, come in and basically do the score saying it's with him, but in this film, it was just Alan Howard took the original recordings and just put more music over them. To bad effect. <laughs> yeah, there's some bits here where it's just really horrible 80s MIDI effect. Yeah, it's very off-brand. Like, there's an interview with him on the DVD where he's like, I gave it a beat, I gave it a rhythm, I gave it a flow. <laughs> yeah, but you also killed a lot of the eeriness of it. Yeah, exactly. We don't need a beat for a horror film. <laughs> yeah. It worked great for Escape from New York, but not here. <laughs> yeah, and Friday the 13th, part three. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine John Carpenter's Friday the 13th Part 3D with that biker gang. That would have been amazing. <laughs> what are we doing next? Uh, next, we are going to be doing John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, cool. It's the big one. For my memory, The Thing is where he peaks. Mm -hmm. And we'll see wh when we get to the other films after that. Yes. But it's The Thing. I'm always excited to watch The Thing. Yep, it's going to be a big deal. Any last thoughts before we call it a night? Michael, what's your problem? Seriously, dude. Seriously. Just drop the knife and give him a hug. Yeah. I don't even think he deserves a hug. He needs some primal scream therapy. I would give him a puppy, but he ate the dog in the first movie. Yeah, and how come... Oh, that's right. They went into the house and were like, there's nothing in there. And I'm like, there's the remains of a dog in there, guys. Cause <laughs> don't you remember from the first movie? Yeah. It should be in there still. Yeah. See, and that's the thing is they build a lot of neat energy in certain sequences, like when they're outside the house pulling out the victims, when they're at the Myers house and people are throwing rocks through it. I wish that energy had carried on throughout the film. Yeah. Some brave neighbors. Everyone's just like out and about and like, oh, there's a killer on the loose. Time to go in, out in my house coat and just muck about. <laughs> I think it actually was really good because if something like that had happened and like dead children were being pulled out of a house two doors down, mm -hmm. people would go insane. Yes, right. they would. It's like a nightmare yeah. <laughs> scenario. I mean, as, as pointless as that scene was, I do like that early scene with the young woman alone in her house where she's talking to her friend and gradually realizing not only is this stuff going on, holy shit, that happened just down the street for me. I'm hearing the police sirens now. Oh my God, my door is open. Yep. There is some neat stuff there, but I would have liked to have had her escape and build something more around her. Mm-hmm. 
So it's like a good setup for a plot that never goes anywhere. Yeah. It's like the kid with the razor blade in his mouth. It's a cool visual just because of the Halloween tie to the legends that it has. But where does it go? Nothing. Nothing. It's, just it's a, like a they show up. Nastiness. Well, I think that's also what upset me because I'm like, why am I watching this? Yeah. There was no point to it. It's like no. they show up, you get stitches, he goes. Everything's awful in Haddonfield. It's the worst town ever. I wrote that down, like, <laughs> worst town ever. And it's like, if they were stuck at the hospital, too, and, like, during the end bit where Michael Myers is chasing her, if the kid, like, leaps out and tries to hamstring him with the razor blade in his mouth. <laughs> it's like, I got this. <laughs> God, I have that visual stuck in my head now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you need that out right away. Yeah. If this movie was in real time, that is still three hours of time in Halloween there's no way anyone would be out trick-or-treating still. <laughs> yeah, because they said when Lori was being taken to the hospital, they're like, it's 11 o'clock. I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Longest night in the world. I mean, like, I get, like, you know, the kid who gets hit by the car and some of the other kids are literally walking home from yeah, the party. Yeah, because they're older. Yeah, drunken yeah. party goers in the, yeah. the downtown, even though I've lived in a small town most of my life and that would never fly. There would be cops and curfews all over the place. Worst town ever. <laughs> <laughs> Taking care of that stuff. See, but it's like, I still like the movie because I like that idea of just literally picking up the moment after. And I think it gives me enough building off of that to still make me interested. And I do really like the added thread of Laurie as his sister, even though it was a little clumsily handled, because that actually gives them a tie that they can build on for other stories. Well, yeah, it's all good ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that they're building from the original story, they're giving you what you want. Yeah. You liked this. Here's some more of this. Yeah. They're adding to it. Right? They needed to yeah. sit down and work it out more thoroughly. Yeah. yeah. They could have had like another fugitive on their hands. They could have had like a Tommy Lee Jones character that was introduced. <laughs> Instead, it was just like one cop being like, nah, check some backyards. Hospital? Nah. Tommy Lee Jones tracking down Michael Myers. That would have been incredible. You know what Tommy Jones <laughs> would have done? Found and killed Michael Myers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to kill this girl. I don't care. <laughs> and I actually like that climax where as silly as it is in concept, where they shoot out his eyes and he's like blindly just swinging the knife and they undo all the gas nozzles. That was a very video game sequence. That's like final boss. And he's just like... Yeah, it was like a big Silent Hill sequence. And then like he still walks out of the flames. Yeah, that's kind of like, yeah, guess what? <laughs> what else would Michael Myers do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's going to keep coming as long as he can. I like that climax. It's silly as shit, but I like it. I still enjoy it. I still enjoy more of this movie than I don't. But I totally get those, like, for you two. And again, this is a film that it has some followers and it has some major detractors. Yeah. If they just adjusted the tone just a little bit, like the tint <laughs> on a TV, yeah. just raise it up a couple notches, I would have probably given it a recommend. Still marginal, but uh, it feels very workmanlike, very joyless to me. Yeah, and to be fair, Rick Rosenthal, I, I went through, I hadn't seen any of his other films I went and I watched the trailers for a lot of them, and they're <laughs> they're they're so typical that they were almost like parodies of trailers. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> like Ruskies, where a group of kids find a Russian who washes up on the beach and try to disguise him as their uncle. What? To what end? <laughs> I'm interested. And he gets to enjoy life in Southern California. Fantastic. Until the police come on his tail, as well as his Russian friends trying to find him. Just stop. Stop right there. Send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sold. <laughs> and then there was like this movie where it's like, John Lithgow is a Vietnam Salt. vet. <laughs> 15 years after the war, he still can't get away from Vietnam. So he spent the last decade just living in the woods. And then he reconnects with his son, but he finds out that he's done more damage to his son by not being there. And the son is played by Ralph Macchio. Well, that sounds great. These, this sounds like an amazing group of films. <laughs> and the son's stepfather is an actual military survivalist who doesn't like Vietnam vets and just starts toying with him with machine guns. And <laughs> it's, it's like, whoa, well, <laughs> it just keeps getting better. <laughs> the films, they don't look bad, but nor do they look particularly good. And they're like, you could cut this as like a parody trailer to like the beginning of Tropic Thunder. Oh, yes, Tropic Thunder. You could yeah. put these in the beginning of Tropic Thunder and they would fit in. That sounds incredible, tracking all these down. Especially Ruskies. I gotta see Ruskies. Yes, you do. It sounds like Encino Man, except slightly racist. And his Bad Boys is a juvenile prison movie. It's a teen prison movie with Sean Penn. With Sean Penn. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And a young Clancy Brown before he played the Kurgan. <laughs> so, anyways, Halloween 2, I still recommend it, but I, I get why you guys don't. 
Halloween two thumbs down over here. Halloween poo. I'll be interesting to hear in retrospect if you think any more of it after we get through some of the other sequels, though I actually think you might enjoy some of those a little bit more. We'll see. We'll see. And they get crazier and crazier. <laughs> this has been another episode of Masters of Carpentry. I have been your host, Alex, and with me are Julia and Noel, and we bid you happy Halloween and cue Mr. Sandman. Five more episodes till Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Thank you.